Good morning. I think what you're going to experience is this. I think about 90% of the state's case, their evidence and their witnesses is going to be focused on what happened. What happened on March 3rd, 2020 inside the Scudder home of the Powell's. And I think you're also going to see that 90% of the defense case is going to be focused on what Mr. McAleese, I think, has correctly identified as the sole core question in this case, and that is why? Why? Why did this happen? What happened is not in dispute. Sidney Powell caused the injuries that led to her mother's death. Why is the question? So to help understand why, I think it's important for you to meet the Powell family. And prior to March of 2020, they were the all-American family. Brenda Powell was 50 years old. She was working as a child life specialist at Akron Children's Hospital. She works in the Pediatric Oncology Center. Brenda's job was to take children who are suffering from cancer through the most difficult journey that a child could ever go through. And she also took that journey with the parents of the children who were diagnosed with cancer. When kids were going through chemo and losing their hair, Brenda was there. When parents were struggling with what to do with this grief, Brenda was there. And Brenda has had a huge, enormous impact on our community. She organized things like a prom to remember. So these kids who were suffering from cancer would have some, some sense of normalcy in their life. She took them bowling. And they loved her, and she loved them, and she was like a second mom to them. That's the kind of skill set Brenda Powell had. You're going to meet and, and hear about and hear from Stephen Powell. Stephen Powell is Brenda's husband, Sydney's father, um, Stephen graduated here from uh, Firestone High School, got an associate's degree, and he is the Assistant Vice President for Quality Assurance of Akron Steel Treating. Akron Steel Treating is a family-owned company. Stephen's grandfather started that company in 1943, 80 years ago. Stephen's grandfather worked there, his father worked there, his uncle worked there, Steve's brother, Joe Powell, is the CEO of Akron Steel Treating. And what you're going to hear is that Stephen and Brenda meet sometime around 1995. You heard the name um, Ken Dees. And Ken is a police officer that was good friends with Stephen while they were in school together. And Ken's wife knew Brenda and started thinking, you know, I know a guy that you might like. And she introduced Stephen to Brenda. In 1995, they dated for about a year, and in 1996, they got married. About three and a half, four years later, on March 21st, 2020, Sydney was born. Um, about three and a half years later, Sydney's younger brother, Brenda, and Stephen's son was born, Andrew Powell. Andrew graduated from St. V and is a student now at Kent State University. But you're going to hear a lot about Sydney Powell. And what you're going to hear is Sydney went to St. Sebastian's uh, elementary school, middle school, finished eighth grade there, and started her high school career at St. Vincent St. Mary's. While she was there, um, she was involved in athletics, played soccer, was on varsity. You'll hear that she was a quiet student, reserve student, a people pleaser, but super smart. You'll hear from Ms. Milligan a teacher that taught Sydney sophomore, junior, and senior year of English. You'll hear that Sydney, the entire time she was at St. V, the lowest grade she ever got was a B. She graduated with a 3.8 GPA and scored a 27 on her ACT. I have to tell you, I only got a 23, so that's kind of impressive. She was an excellent student. 
And not only was she an excellent student and on the honor roll every semester at St. V's, she was a good person. Ms. Milligan will talk to you about, you know, I saw something in Sydney that I wanted other people to emulate. So we went on a religious retreat together and Ms. Mulligan took Sydney and made her a mentor for other students to look up to and emulate. Sydney played soccer, as I indicated, and Ms. Mulligan's gonna talk to you about her watching Sydney and Brenda interact and their relationship. And you're gonna hear from lots of different people about that relationship, friends, family members, co-workers. This was the all-American family. Um, Stephen would take the family to Disney World. They would go to the beach. They'd vacation together. You're going to hear there is absolutely no history of violence, of drugs or alcohol or dysfunction of any kind. You're going to hear from people who knew this family best. You're going to hear from some of the folks who saw Sydney and Brenda interact together. What you're going to hear is they were super close. Sydney was like Brenda's mini me. And Brenda was Sydney's best friend. And on Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020, Sydney killed her best friend, her mother. Why? Why did that happen? We're going to spend next week bringing you answers to that sole core question. I submit to you the only question in this case, which is why. And we're gonna bring you three different experts. You're gonna hear from Dr. James Reardon. Dr. James Reardon will introduce himself to you and you'll hear that he's a psychologist who's been working in that field for 45 years in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Dr. Reardon, Reardon has done forensic psychiatric evaluations to determine competency and sanity at the time of the offense. And he's done that for nearly 2,000 patients in civil and criminal context. You'll hear that Dr. Reardon has worked with the Columbus Blue Jackets, University of Missouri football team, the New York Jets. And in fact, he was chosen to be a sports psychologist for the United States Olympic team. Those are his credentials. And he spent seven hours with Sidney Powell in December of 2021, testing her. Not only just talking to her, but administering the test that will tell us and teach us about the why. He did cognitive functioning test. He did tests to determine if she was possibly malingering. Is she faking this? Personality tests. And he will tell you that in his expert opinion, at the time of the offense, Sydney was suffering from a severe mental disease, schizophrenia. And that severe mental disease prevented her from knowing the wrongfulness of her conduct. You'll hear from Tom Swales. Tom Swales is a board certified clinical neuropsychologist, and he's been doing that since 1998. In 2016, he was given the job of doing court ordered evaluations for Cuyahoga County. So for men and women who are charged with serious felony offenses in Cuyahoga County, he tells the judges and the prosecutors and defense attorneys and sometimes the jury whether or not that person is competent, whether or not they were sane at the time of the offense. Here in Summit County, you're here, we have a, a, a doctor named Dr. Wood and psychodiagnostic. They work with the court system here and they do competency and sanity evaluations. Dr. Swales does that in Cuyahoga County. You will hear that Dr. Swales first started seeing Sydney in December and January of 20, I'm sorry, January of 2021. He spent seven hours with her the first time talking, testing. He spent eight hours with Sydney the second time he met with her in early January 2021. He tested her again just this last July, uh, July 23rd, and spent another seven hours with her. He will tell you about the tests that he knows that are recognized in his profession to make determinations to answer the why. And he's gonna to talk to you about his conclusion, which is, again, at the time of the offense, 
Sidney Powell was suffering from a severe mental disease that was schizophrenia. And that severe mental disease prevented her from knowing the wrongfulness of her conduct. You're going to hear finally from Dr. Robin Belcher Timmy. Dr. Timmy's board certified in forensic psychology in Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, and Ohio. Uh, he worked, works now at the Delaware Department of Corrections to help the individuals there make programming for violent criminal offenders, offenders. That's part of his job. Before that, he taught English in the Bronx, and he's familiar with at-risk factors for youth. He did multiple testings with Sydney over multiple days, and he will tell you that Sydney, at the time of the offense, was suffering from schizophrenia, and that schizophrenia prevented her from knowing the wrongfulness of her conduct. As Mr. McAlee said, the judge's role is to give you the law. So I know no one on the prosecution side, and certainly not me, would ever intentionally mislead you about the law. If we say something that's different than what ultimately the judge says, listen to the judge. That's her job. But what I believe she's going to tell you about insanity is this. The plea of not guilty by reason of insanity raises the issue of insanity of the defendant at the time of the commission of the act. To establish the defense of insanity, the defendant must prove by the greater weight of the evidence that at the time of the offense, she did not know as a result of a severe mental disease the wrongfulness of her act. That's the law. What I believe the judge is also going to tell you about the law in Ohio is, is there a thing called temporary insanity? How long does this have to last? And what I believe she's going to tell you is this. Insanity may be of short or long duration. The test for insanity remains the same, irrespective of its duration. Whether a form of temporary insanity exists in this case is a question of fact for you to determine, for you to decide. There will be three options in this case. Guilty, not guilty by reason of insanity, or guilty. And we are not only going to bring you those three experts that tell you based on their experience, based on the testing that they performed, based on all the records that they reviewed, Sydney meets the definition of insanity in Ohio. We're going to bring you other records and other witnesses to talk about what led up to March 3rd, 2020. And what you're going to hear is there are classic, classic symptoms of schizophrenia that now, looking back, these doctors can point and identify and talk about that were missed. They're going to talk to you about how schizophrenia manifests itself in late teens and early 20s. That's when this is common. You're going to hear that Cindy was reporting before March of 2020 audio and visu visual hallucinations. She was hearing voices. You're not worth anything. You're worthless. People know it. You're a failure. Those were the voices. She was seeing things, cartoon figures, looking like fire was coming out of her hands. She's going to talk about these, delu the doctors are going to talk about and the records are going to show these delusions of reference, meaning Sydney believed that everyone was talking about her. Miss Mulligan, the teacher from St. V, is going to come in and talk to you about an episode, a specific episode when Sydney was in her junior year at St. V. This is when she had a 3.8 grade point average, doing extremely well. She had a project. And you'll see when stress is placed upon Sydney or anyone with a serious and severe mental disease, bad things happen. When Sydney had to give this project, all of a sudden she kind of froze. And she tells Ms. Mulligan, I couldn't read the numbers. A friend of Sydney's takes her to their favorite teacher, Ms. Mulligan, and they talk. And Ms. Milligan, the teacher, will tell you that Sydney was really confused, was distraught, was upset. I had never seen her like this. And it was what we would all now probably call a panic attack. You're going to hear that during the time that Sydney was playing soccer, she suffered from two concussions. And we'll present the medical records where she sought treatment about a concussion. And you'll hear from our doctors about what concussions could potentially do 
to a young person's brain development. You're going to hear that this 3.8 grade point average student at St. V really began to struggle at Mount Union. She started Mount Union in the fall of 2018. And by the end of that first year, that 3.8 grade point average went down to, I think, a 2.12. And Sydney was placed on academic probation. And the university told her, look, if you don't get your grades up, there's going to be a problem. You could get suspended. And that's exactly what happened. In December of 2019, Sydney was suspended from the Mount Union University. As you heard, Mount Union sends a letter. That letter goes to the home. And on December 21st, 2019, while Sydney's at home during Christmas break, she gets that letter and she signs for it. Now Sydney knows, I can't come back to school. And we heard Mr. McAleese talk about the lies. And Sydney was telling her roommates, everything's okay. Even that freshman year, when her friend, Lauren Curry, her best friend at the time, her roommate at the time, the person who knew her from high school, tried to put her in an executive position at the sorority, the university said, no, she's on academic probation. She can't have that position. And Lauren confronts Sydney. What's going on? Oh, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. And she eventually comes clean with her and said, I'm really struggling, which was a total shock to Lauren. That's the typical college, high school stuff. That's the lie. Everything's going to be OK. I'm struggling with high school. I'm struggling with grades. I'm trying to adapt. Mr. McAleese talked about a lie being heavy. And in this case, the lie is way heavier than the truth. This is more than a lie. This is a false reality. This is, this is Sydney creating a world where everything is OK. I mean, how can you imagine going back to the university when you've been expelled? You know you can't be there. But she still says that. She shows up in January of 20. And her name's not on the door. Her key card's not working. She can't get food in the cafeteria. She's not in any classes. But she's created this fake reality, this false alternative reality that everything's OK. She's strapping on her backpack and pretending to walk to class. She's hiding out in the student center, the study room, waiting for her friends to come back. She's pretending to study. And the voices are getting louder. And her symptoms are growing stronger. She's sleeping more. She's isolating. She isn't going out. And she is not dealing with reality. The doctors are going to tell you that paranoia is like living in a constant state of terror. You're afraid you're going to be found out. You're afraid the truth will be exposed. You're afraid you're a total failure and life will come crashing down. The week before this incident is kind of a blur for Sydney. She tells her roommates, you know what, I'm going to take the rest of the semester off. I'm going to go home. I'm going to get my stuff together, yes. get a job, and I'll come back maybe the following semester. Sorry, Judge. That's OK, Aaron.
Okay, thank you, Honor. So you're going to hear that about a week before this incident, Sydney finally leaves Mount Union, packs up her stuff, <clears throat> and continues to project this alternative reality. You know, I'm going to take the rest of the semester off. I'll be back. Everything's okay. I'm going to go back home. I'm going to live with home. My parents know all about it. Everything's great. But Sydney really can't go home. So for a week, she's just bouncing around from hotel to hotel. I'm sure terrified, paranoid, delusional. And on March 2nd, the night before this incident, she has some glimpse of normality. She goes back to the university. She's with her friends again. They're watching The Bachelorette. She's laughing and everything seems okay again but she has to leave that warm, safe, friendly confine and go back out. And she can't deal with that reality so much so that she texts her friend, I'm home. When the reality is she's in a hotel room, alone, terrified, delusional, and on the verge of a massive psychotic breakdown. And that breakdown happens the next day when she shows up at home and her dad talks to her. What's going on? What's happening? By this time, Steve knows. He knows what's happening. You know what? I'm going to call mom. This is what mom does. This is the skill set that mom has. She deals with kids in conflict maybe better than anybody on the planet. And Brenda shows up. And they have this conversation, and Brenda's trying to make sense of it. And Sydney's still trying to say, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to take the semester off. And Brenda knows, and Steve knows, that it's not a semester off. You've been suspended. And the last thing Sydney remembers is mom saying, it's going to be OK. She's giving her a hug on the couch. It's going to be OK. And in that moment, Sydney has a psychotic break from reality everything comes crashing in and for the next 25 minutes everything Sidney Powell said everything she did was done because of a severe mental disease schizophrenia that prevented her from knowing the wrongfulness of her conduct how do we know that this evidence that you're gonna see screams out insanity the brutality of this incident screams out insanity. The lack of a motive screams out insanity. You're going to hear that there was no planning of this incident. There was no attempt to flee. Sydney's car is in the garage. If she truly appreciated the wrongfulness of, act, of her acts, she would have fled. She would have washed the blood off her. She would have changed her clothes. You're going to see pictures of the sinks and the tubs in the Powell household. There was no attempt to wash any blood off, no attempt to clean the clothes, no attempt to hide the clothes. The trash cans are photographed. The police are trying to figure out why. You're going to see this body-worn camera of these two officers. And I ask you to watch Officer Legacy's camera carefully. And what you're going to see in Officer Jackson's body-worn camera, what you're going to see is Officer Jackson taking Sydney out of the house and putting her down by the bottom of the driveway near the mailbox. It's raining. And about five minutes after that, Sydney falls over and hits her face on the cold, wet pavement and goes catatonic. You'll see it for yourself. Her face is scratching on, on the pavement, and you'll see the pictures of that. She's clawing on the asphalt and you'll see the pictures of that she's hyperventilating she's in shock and she's catatonic and she's taken from the scene to Akron City Hospital and at Akron City Hospital she spends March 3rd and March 4th there and you will hear and see from Detective Bertina King who tries to go and make sense of this at this point law enforcement doesn't know is she a victim is she a suspect what's going on and Sydney is completely catatonic. She's mumbling to herself, get out, get out, get out. 
So what do the professionals at Akron, I'm sorry, Akron City Hospital say on March 3rd and March 4th, within an hour and 24 hours of this incident? They say that she is incoherent, she's placed in protective isolation uh, for psychiatric concerns. She is showing psychiatric symptoms of catatonia and Dr. Ivan, who evaluates her, says, and you'll have these records, there is a concern for acute psychosis as a result of schizophrenia, concerns also for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. That's not our experts. That's the hospital that's saying this within hours of Sydney arriving there. On March 4th, Sydney was charged and she was discharged from Akron City Hospital. She uh, was then transported to the Summit County Jail and was there March 5th and March 6th. On March 6th, she's released after Stephen Powell posted her bond. And there are mental health professionals at the Summit County Jail who look at her and evaluate her. And what they say is, if this client is released from jail, she is to be involuntarily hospitalized. Sydney's released on March 6th. She goes from the Summit County Jail to Portage Path Emergency Services, PES, P-P-E-S, Portage Path Emergency Services. And they see her for a day and a half, maybe two days. And they recommend inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. You can't go home. You have to go to an inpatient, involuntary psychiatric hospital, and that's what Sydney does. She goes from Portage Path to Akron General Cleveland Clinic, and she spends the next nine days in the psychiatric hospital there. So for nine days, there are experts whose only job, whose only motivation is to help the people in that institution who evaluate her. They talk to her and they perform the tests that are recognized in the field of psychology to answer the question why. And what happens is based on that testing, the observation, they come up with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And they also say we're gonna to have to rule out possible epilepsy because there's this thing with the concussions. There's concern that maybe this was a seizure. What's going on? Let's, let's answer the question why. So Sydney goes to University Hospital in June and July of 2020 and you'll have those records. And she's undergone a whole battery of tests over about six days. They do an MRI, they do an fMRI and you'll hear about what all those tests tell us. And the result is it wasn't a seizure. The only explanation for what happened is a psychological breakdown, schizophrenia. While Sydney was at Akron General Medical Center, which is also Cleveland Clinic, for those nine days, she's treated by Dr. Michael Favreur, F-A-R-I-U-R. And not only does he diagnose her with schizophrenia, but he starts to treat her with medication for the first time. And this isn't a baby aspirin. He's giving her medication called Abilify. And you'll hear about what that is and what it does and how it responds in the body. She's given Ativan. She's given Depakote to, quote, prevent future blackouts and potential violence. And you know what? Sydney responds well to the medication. Over the course of nine days, she's starting to respond better to the point where she can be released in the doctor's opinion. And on March 17th, Sydney's released to her maternal grandmother, Betsy Brown. And she's remained there ever since. What you're gonna hear is there was then outpatient treatment, um, a psychiatrist, Dr. Anthony Smartnick first started seeing Sydney in March of 2020. And he continues to see her to this day. And you'll hear, and you'll see the records from Dr. Smartnick, and I believe you'll hear from him. He also diagnosed Sydney Powell with schizophrenia and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, as a result of what occurred on March 3rd, 2020. And he continued to prescribe Sydney the antipsychotic medication that she was responding to well initially. You'll see the records that Sydney starts counseling. She starts to see Dr. Deborah Sally, who diagnoses Sydney with schizophrenia 
and continues to treat her for that severe mental disease. You'll hear that Sydney is now seeing a counselor named Michelle Ferrant, F-E-R-R-A-N-T, Ferrant, sorry, who continues to treat her today for schizophrenia and post-traumatic stress disorder. You'll hear the efforts to try to make her be able to tolerate and, and sit through this trial, how the medication was upped, knowing that it's gonna be a traumatic experience. You're gonna hear doctors and experts tell you what would happen if I don't have a serious mental disease and I take all these drugs? They're going to tell you you'd be a zombie. You'd probably be drooling. You wouldn't be able to function in the day-to-day -day world. This isn't pretend. This is medicine. Sydney has responded well to the medicine that has been prescribed for a serious mental disease, schizophrenia. We're going to ask you to trust the science. Every single professional that has seen Sidney Powell has made the same diagnosis. Schizophrenia has prescribed medication. Mental illness is a real thing. The medication that is used to treat it is a real thing. That's what's happening here. Dr. Swales, after spending all that time with Sydney and testing her, will tell you, reviewing the medical records, the school records, the police reports, the witness statements, he will tell you that at the time of the offense, Sydney did have a severe mental disease, schizophrenia disorder, and that disease prevented her from knowing the wrongfulness of her conduct. Dr. Swales will tell you on March 3rd, 2020, Ms. Powell was delusional and irrational. She lost control. She was in the midst of a psychotic, violent break and did not know the wrongfulness of her conduct. Dr. Timmy, who knows these risk factors for at-risk youth, who's responsible for helping treat prisoners in the Delaware Correctional System, spends all this time with Sydney, testing her, and he will tell you this. Ms. Powell was raised in an intact family by parents who consistently supported her. Her childhood does not appear to include the adversity very often seen in a population of people charged with murder. Nor did Ms. Powell present with any of the hallmarks of the risks for violence known in peer-reviewed literature. She has no history of violence, no history of antisocial behavior, no history of problems with employment or relationships, no history of substance abuse or major, major prior mental disorders, no history of personality disorders or traumatic experiences, no violent attitudes or problems with adherence to treatment. By all accounts, Ms. Powell and her mother were very close and confided in one another. Ms. Powell was able to rely on her mother for support and encouragement. In fact, Ms. Powell was shocked that her mother was warm and supportive about her academic woes, even in the final moments before her death. Ms. Powell was in a full-blown psychosis at that point and was completely unaware of her actions. Dr. Reardon, who spent all that time with Sidney Powell, who reviewed the records, police reports, school records, hospital records, medication, doses, amounts, who noted breakthrough symptoms, meaning there were times over the last three and a half years where Sydney would regress a little bit and hear voices again or start having those thoughts creep in. And this time she had the courage to tell people who were in her life, her counselors, and they prescribed new and different medication, and it worked. Science is real. Mental health is a thing. Dr. Reardon will tell you at the time of the offense, Ms. Powell had a severe mental disease, schizophrenia, and as a result of this severe mental disease, she was unable to appreciate the wrongfulness of her actions as charged. She was in a psychotic state, out of touch with reality, and unable to know the wrongfulness of her acts. He will tell you that he has been consulted on in capital murder cases where people are facing the death penalty, not only by the defense, but also by the prosecution and by the Ohio Attorney General's Office. 
consulted on those cases, and what he will tell you is, I have rarely, if ever, seen a situation where an individual was in such an utterly compromised psychological state as Sidney Powell. The science is overwhelming, and it supports insanity. More powerful than the science, more persuasive than the witnesses, is the inescapable truth and the undeniable conclusion that the Powell family is a good family. Sidney Powell didn't kill her mother because she was upset about being suspended from Mount Union. This family has suffered a nightmare of unimaginable consequences. In less than two weeks, I will stand before you and ask you to end that nightmare and return verdicts of not guilty by reason of insanity. Thank you.